Well, I just want to thank everybody this morning for giving me this opportunity to be in God's house. I don't know about anybody else, but uh, how many else is, how many else, everyone else, are you happy to be here today? You, you got to be. You got to be. Seriously. God did a lot for us. He gave us a son. He, he sent him down here to be part of us. So we've got to be happy about that. But you know, we live in a, we live in a very conflicted world today. And I do mean it is conflicted. I've watched over my life. I was born in 1955. I've seen over my lifetime a lot of changes coming. But this has been one of the worst. This has been one of the worst changes I've ever seen in this world. We are headed down a very bad path. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd like for you to turn with me to the book of Romans, the 12th chapter. Verse 1 and 2, I've got a lot of scripture to go over this morning, and I'm not going to try and keep everybody long, but I do have a lot of scripture to go over this morning. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Go with me in prayer. Father, we do thank you today for this opportunity to be here. I thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. I thank you today, Lord, for all those who have stepped into your house, who have stepped out on faith. Now today, Lord, I pray that you would be with me in this pulpit today, that you would strengthen me, and Lord, that the Spirit of God would come down on this church as a mighty rain. Now, Lord, be with each and every one who's come here today and be with those who are in the hospitals. Lord, we ask you to be with our soldiers and that you would be with our law enforcement. And, Lord, that you would just touch each and every one of them, that you would strengthen them and keep them protected at all times. Now, Lord, we do thank you for your son and for what he did for us. For this we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as Christians... We, uh, in today's world, we are struggling. You know, we've got, we got the disease out there, COVID. I had it. And I took the two shots. And the two shots made me as sick as the, the disease itself. <laughs> it just about killed me. I see others shaking their head. <laughs> yeah. We're struggling through a lot of tough times. A lot of things are going on. We're struggling with COVID, corrupt leaders, and attacks to the very core of our Christian values and beliefs. And it's something that I've been watching for years. I watched them take prayer out of school. I watched them take Bibles out of school. And guess what we ended up with? A messed up, a messed up country. They keep taking everything away from us. They would, if you gave them the chance, they would shut down our churches. But we as Christian peoples today, exactly what is put right here says that, I beseech you therefore, brother. Now he is talking to us, saying, I beseech you. You've got to take up. You've got to take up the battle right now. You cannot ignore what is out there. Now, I've always said, you know, they have that old saying about the old uh, ostrich sticks his head in the sand. That ostrich forgets that line will get him from behind right then. Do not stick your head in the sand and think that all of this is going to go away because it is not. It is here, and we've got to fight. We have become camouflaged. I don't, how many here are hunters? I know I talked to a young man this morning. He's, he's a hunter. We all like to hunt. And some of the things you do, one of the first things you do is get your camouflage gear out, and you take off with your weapons, and you, take, and you go out and you, you try to fool these animals where they can't see you. Okay? That, that's part of it. I was a soldier. Anyone else in, in the military? Yeah. No? No other military? Okay. okay. Well, we, we know. We know about camouflage. We know about hiding amongst the enemy. And it makes it very easy. Sometimes you can hide and, and they can't see you. And they can sit and tell you everything and you're not going to say a word. That's what the Christian has become today. We have become a camouflage group of people walking around in a world that is willing to, if you go over to Afghanistan and you say, I'm a Christian, they're going to take you and behead you. Mm-hmm. 
We have become too afraid of the world and what they're going to think about us. I don't, want, I, I don't care what they think about me. They need to know what I think about them today. I think I am a Christian. My God is still in control of this world. Whether, he, whether anybody out there believes it today or not, He is still in control. He is still the one. He is still the one who controls everything that we do in this world and in this life today. And if we don't understand and accept that, we better not call ourselves Christians. We better know today that God is still the purpose. God is still the one who takes care. You know, I put everything I've got into God. I love to go fishing. First thing I do, and I get in that boat, get ready to take off. I pray, God, give me a good, safe day on the water. Whether I catch a fish or not, the main thing is, God, you will be with me. And he always blesses me. He always blesses me. We are camouflaged. We blend in with the world so well today. And I, we're all, we all do it. We all do it. Even, you know, I'm guilty of it. Everybody's guilty. We kind of blend in. You get out there sometimes, you say, I don't think I want to be with, I don't want to be bothered with these people today. But you know, God said, they must see Jesus in you in order for us to make a difference. Am I right? Amen. If they can't see Jesus in us today, how are we going to convert the sinful world? We have got to put it forward. We have got to stop blending in and we've got to stop you know, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but we have got to stop trying to look like the world. Okay? You, you know what I'm saying? And it's not just in our dress. It's our mannerisms. We have got to let people know who we are. We are Christians. And I, I'm proud to be a Christian. I, come from, I came from a very uh, Christian-oriented family. It goes way, way back. I'm just part of something they started. Both my granddads were Baptist ministers, and uh, I was told after I became a minister, my mom came to me and she said, it all came true. Well, I said, what? She said, the day my daddy looked at you in that crib and said, there is my Baptist minister. It came true. God had already foreseen it. God had already put it together. Now, believe me, believe me today, I did not want to be a minister. I was happy doing what I was doing. I sang gospel music for years. I loved that stuff. I loved it. Wasn't anything any greater to get up there and start singing a gospel song and hear somebody jump up and shout. And the spirit fall down on top of you. It was so enjoyable. It made you feel good inside. But you can ask that lady right there. She watched me struggle for so many years. And I kept saying to God, now, I am not a public speaker. And I wasn't. You couldn't get me up in front of anybody other than to sing. And I didn't want to sing lead. I just wanted to do the harmony part because I had this little squeaky tenor voice back in the day. And I could hit some really high notes and stuff. And people loved it. People enjoyed it. I thought, oh, this is great. And then you get that guy down there, it's got that real low, deep voice. And you put it all together, and, and we had this great time in the Lord. And see the people shout, see the people even come and, and, and become part of what we were doing. See him accept Jesus Christ through the music. That's what you call letting Jesus shine in your light. Okay? He called me to be a minister. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a little dry this morning. He called me to be a minister. And I, I said, Lord, I do not want to do this. I'm no good at that. I was a terrible student in school. And I did not like to study. Well, you know, God's Word says to study to show thyself approved. Okay. And she knows. <laughs> I go back in my office. And I, that's all I do. I, I work on this. And she, she stays on me. That's a good wife. She stays on me. 
She says, have you got your message ready? Have you got everything ready to go? And I've been a minister since 1982, 83, yeah. Have you got it ready to go? Yeah, I think. <laughs> you don't know how many times I've got up there with all this wrote down nice and neat and pretty. Ready to, ready to really put it out there. Get up there and flip my Bible open and it wasn't to what was right here. It's right there. God changed it. Because there was something there. There was something there. There was someone there who needed to hear what God had written. Not what I'd written, but what God had written. When we as Christians become conformed, and that was the, the title of my sermon today, the conformed Christian. I'm not talking about being conformed as a Christian. I'm talking about a Christian who is conforming to the worldly ways. Satan, I'm telling you, he's alive. He's out there today. He's running to and fro. He is jumping up and down. He is saying, I've got you. You belong to me. And I'm going to take everything that you give me. And I'm going to turn it around to make you look so foolish. God expects us today to be that Christian, to show the world what we're all about. You know, I, I, get, I hear a lot, and I, I, worked in the, I worked in the steel industry for over 30 years. Now, if you want to hear a bunch of rough people, get around some old, they call them roughnecks. Get around some of them guys sometimes. Whew. I mean, the words that come out of them, they don't turn around and look at me, oh, I'm sorry they're a preacher. No, you're not. You did it on purpose. You did it for a reason. Because Satan has got a hold of you. He doesn't have a hold of me. He's got you. We've become camouflaged. We're blending in too much. Now the next thing I want to say, and this, this one what really hurts. Silencing the word. Okay? Silencing the word. The very word of God. The very thing that keeps us, as far as I'm concerned, keeps us alive. I had a uh, major heart attack when I was 49 years old. Now you want an eye opener. Many have probably had similar situations. But you want an eye opener? Let that ticker try to give you trouble. The old saying was one foot in the grave and the other one was on banana peel. I was there. I was slipping. The doctor told me, said, well you're going to bed that night. You even woke up the next morning. Well, I wouldn't have woke up here, but I would have woke up with God. But I wouldn't have woke up here. God had another purpose for me. He had more things ready for me. So he has taught me over the years, do not silence my word. We as Christians have just, we're afraid. How many? I know everybody here has got one of these. I don't care what's the King James Version. What's well, New English version? Whatever the version is. Mine has got a big old cross on the front of it. Whatever it is, right here, right here, is where we are. This is us, this book. And we have become a people who hide this. We hide it. Don't hide this. Let everybody see it. Because sometimes this will get their curiosity. It'll get them looking, get them thinking. There are times when we are to remain silent. Okay? Now don't misunderstand. There are times when we are to remain silent, and there are times when we are to speak up. Don't be afraid to speak up. But there are times to be silent. We remain silent when we're removing ourselves from a conflict. How many times have you ever got into an argument with somebody and looked at that individual, start to say something? Uh-uh. No, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stoop to that level. Turn around, walk off. That silence is what you need to do as a Christian. That's the silence I'm talking about. Silencing ourselves from getting involved in a conflict. We all do it. We all do it. 
As a youngster, I had a temper that was just out of this world. My mom was alive. She detest to it. That young and had a terrible temper. Terrible. Got me in trouble a lot, too, as a youngster. But we've got to learn to walk away from conflicts. Don't, don't involve. Don't, don't connect with it. Because that's exactly what that individual wants. That's what Satan wants. Because they can start turning it around for you and make you so angry that you'll say things that you normally would not say. So it's best to silence yourself. Walk away. Don't conform yourself to these things that are going on in the world. We want to be silent when we're being instructed. I know as a mechanic and a welder over the years, trying to teach another man something, how to do something in particular. It's very hard when he keeps trying to tell you how to do it. And you've already got 30 years experience. It's very hard, you know. Be silent. Let it sink in. We kind of touched on that a little bit in the Sunday school class. Learning new things, being silent, be, doing the things that needs to be done in order to become better Christians. Now sometimes we must go before the Lord and stand in His presence. Now I tell you there, there's where you really need to be silent. Go before the Lord. I tell you some of my best times have been on my knees, not saying a word, but listening. Listening, listening for what God has to say. What God has God intended for you. Sometimes we need to be silent and get away from distractions to hear the Lord. I don't know if anybody here done much mechanic. Have you ever slipped off a wrench? Now, I worked on heavy equipment. My wrenches were about this big. They weighed more than I did. But if you've ever slipped off a wrench and broke the back of your hand or broke a thumb, boy, I'm telling you what, you can jump around there for 30 minutes. And every thought in the world comes into your head. But you can't let it go. Keep silent. She laughs at me over the years. I broke a thumb. And a few days later, broke my foot. And uh, I walked around trying to preach. I was doing like this. But when I did that thumb, I reared back with a big old hammer trying to knock a seal out. And I hit the edge of that thing on my... That three-pound hammer did a job on my thumb. And I jumped around limping. I said, Lord, Lord, it's on you. Because I've got a lot of words coming in my head right now, and I do not want them to go anywhere. That's when we've got to really buckle down and learn to be silent. We must learn to be silent before Him. Sometimes silence is a sin. And that's what I'm trying to get by right now. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Silence can be a sin. There's many times when Christians don't stand up. And I think we see it in today's society right now. We don't stand up. We're afraid to get out there. Well, sinners not. I mean, goodness gracious, they got their signs put up and they're, they're, they're conflicting everything that we believe and they, they want to push us down, but yet they got their signs up and they're running up and down the streets having a great old time. And the Christians, what? That's why we're in trouble. That's why we're, we're dealing with the problems that we have today. We cannot continue these things. If we do, this, this country, this world, I'm not going to say just the country, this whole world is going to fall. It's not going to be a bad thing for us because we believe, okay? It's not going to be such a bad thing for us. But we have grandchildren. We have future children. We have, we have all these relatives, friends, and, and loved ones. We don't want to see them going in. The last thing I would want is for anyone be sent to hell that is the last thing I would want and believe me that thumb and that foot ain't nothing compared to what you're going to feel there it's tough Christians have got a hard road God never said that it was ever going to be easy he never said that he did tell us that we will have a lot of turmoil we'll have a lot of problems we'll have a lot of things going on in this life 
Just because we are Christians and we are believers doesn't mean that things aren't going to happen. My son had cancer when he was a baby. Lost the sight in his left eye. They had to remove the eye itself. And I thought, oh Lord, why? He had a purpose. He had a purpose. That boy's in church every day, every Sunday. We all have these kind of problems. My heart attack. Everybody has these kind of things. God never said it was going to be a bed of roses. He never, he never claimed that. His son taught us that things wouldn't be easy. Christ didn't have it easy, did he? Has anybody ever thought about when Christ, before he went to the cross? I mean, the cross was easy after, after what he went through. The cross was actually easy. Because that was the final step. But before he was chastised, he was beaten, a crown of thorns put on his head, the blood ran down, he was beaten with a cat of nine tails. Anybody know what cat of nine tails is? That is a nasty, a nasty form of punishment. And the Romans were really good at this stuff. Number one, they would take this thing, and instead of it just being the leather, they fixed it up really good for Christ. They took sharpened pieces of bone and put it on the ends of the cat of nine tails. And beat him profusely until he bled and the flesh was actually torn off of him. It's not a bed of roses as people think. People look at me and say, oh, you Christians got a good life. Well, I've got a good life. I've got a good life. But it's not without its problems. We all have them. It's something that you have to deal with, but we cannot remain silent in this world and expect these things to go away. We have got brothers and sisters in foreign lands who are dying every day for the gospel, for Jesus Christ. We have our sisters and brothers, and they're, they're, they're out there. They've thrown caution in the wind, and they say, I'm not worried about it. God is with me. And even if they're caught and they lose their lives, they still win. The victory is theirs. Now, you know, the old saying is, uh, you know, see, you go up and ask somebody, how are you doing today? And that person says, well, I, I'm above ground. Oh, that's a good thing. Well, for a Christian, no, that's not the greatest thing. Yeah. What have we got? When we die, we gain. We don't lose. We win it all right then. But up until that point, we have got to fight a very, very difficult fight. It's not easy. It's not. And we cannot hide ourselves away. We can't do it. We're to speak up. Tell the world about the Word of God. Don't hide it. You've got to speak up. Too many Christians have become worldly and are afraid to stand up and speak. Now, that's just the problem we have today. They become worldly. They would rather mix in with the world and be able to drive that new Corvette or that new Mustang or all those things. Not saying anything wrong with being able to buy those things. It's a great thing. But you better keep God in it. Keep God in it. I don't drive a lot of fancy stuff. I've got an older pickup truck. 2013, and I just keep it running. I just keep it going. It's, it's, it's mine. I don't worry about it. I don't need any of the other things. But we must stand up, and we must speak out. And, and I've seen all these... Man, I should quit watching news, really, is what I should do. I should quit watching it. Because there's nothing but bad on there anymore. You can't see anything good. My wife's found a little baby squirrel in our front yard. Now, I do mean a baby. It was about this big. Still pink. They called it a pinky at the rescue place. It was a pinky. Little baby squirrel. She took that little squirrel into the house. She put it on a heating pad. She fed it. We kept it alive. We took it to a rescue station. They took the animal in. You can't get anything accomplished if you don't go out and do it. She worked kind of, to me, was kind of a miracle. Because I, I said, that poor little thing's going to die. 
<laughs> Not with her around, it didn't. <laughs> it, uh, it survived. And I just thought it was a miracle, but it was God. God had a purpose for us doing that. Even if it was just to appease our souls, make us feel better, God let us do that. Now we're conformed to by our appearance. In the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 9, or chapter 2, verse 9, it says, In like manner, also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. We blend in today by trying to buy the best of suits. I don't know how many of y'all watch some of the TV ministers out there, and uh, that's a preference for everybody. But I get such a kick out of watching some of these guys, and they rope their arm like that. My watch right here came from Walmart. <laughs> There's Rolex. Now, who's living in the world? Mm-hmm. And all he's doing is preaching. For the most part, when I fill in at our church, I, I don't ask for a dime, don't ask for a dime from anybody. Don't want it. The first thing is, I'm God's servant. This is what God pays me to do. God pays me. He pays me through His love, His generosity, because He has blessed me and my wife and my family. He blesses us in so many different ways. By not being conformed to this world, we are blessed. We're given things. God takes care of us, but it's still not going to be easy. And he says in like manner that nobody, and it's not just talking about women, talking about men. I watch a man walk into the church and he's got a big gold necklace on and gold rings and, you know, solid. He's got more on his wrists and his neck than I have in my house. It's not necessary. God doesn't require that. God wants us to bring ourselves, our spiritual self, our body. Bring it to God and give Him all the praise. By our language, and I touched on that already. I've worked around a lot of rough people. I was in the service. And uh, when I was in the service, I just got accustomed to the language. And it just, you got accustomed to it. You didn't think anything about it. But they were doing a specific thing. They were training you to be a warrior. Warriors cannot be weak. You can't. There's another thing I'm going to be getting at here in just a few minutes. A warrior cannot be weak. By our language, now I want you to know this one right here. In the book of Matthew, the 26th chapter, verse 74. It says, Then began he to curse and swear, saying, I know not this man. This was Peter denying Jesus for the third time. Jesus told him, he said, You will deny me three times for the cock crows. Mm -hmm. And how did he do it? He conformed himself right then. He made himself look like part of the world, that world which hated Jesus Christ, that world which destroyed him, took his life. That's the world he conformed to right at that point in time. Why? Because he was afraid. And it's okay to be afraid. But Peter, as we know, went on to be the rock of the church. The foundation. God had already, Christ had already told him about that. And in our habits, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, it says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Turn from everything that you've done there, walk away from it, and you will be my sons and daughters. Now, isn't that, isn't that a great thought? That is a great thought this morning. If I just... I don't need the world. I don't need the world. If I walk to God and walk with Him, I take that walk 
and I have my talk with God, the world falls behind. No matter what man does, he says, Wherefore come out from among them. Come out. Walk out. Get out of it. Sin is sin no matter how you look at it, where it is, what kind it is. It is sin. Walk out of it. Get away from it. Because God expects us as Christians to be that light of the world. And again in Romans 12 chapter, second verse, it says for us not to be conformed. That's the very first thing it says there in that second verse. And be not conformed to this world. We have become a group of people that who are conforming because we're afraid. And I understand. I understand that we're afraid. I am too. I'm afraid of the future. I'm afraid to see what's going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years. It scares me. I've still got youngsters. I've got teenage grandsons. They're just now getting started. What has this world to offer them except the bad? That's all they, that's all they have. How many millions and millions of babies have been destroyed in the womb? How many? How far do we as Christians have to go before we say, enough is enough? It's time to wake up. It's time for us to be the Christian we're supposed to be. We are the ones that people look to. We need to see more and more people out there with those signs that are saying, Save that baby. Because I can I tell you right now, there are people lined up in adoption agencies wanting a child. For goodness sakes, have the child. Give it away if that's what you have to do. Let some loving parent have that baby. Don't take its life. Oh my goodness, every time I see it, I, I want to cry because I know God is almost crying in heaven. Why have my children become so vile and so destructive that we destroy our own children in the womb? Enough is enough. God is calling on us every day to be better Christians. Don't conform to this world because once we start conforming, then we start saying, oh, yeah, I can see it's okay for, for them to take that baby. And they're not just taking the baby soon. My gosh, they're waiting until these children are fully developed before they take them. I'm appalled at this country today. I'm appalled at the politicians who, who let this thing go. It's time for we as Christians to say, enough. Take back what is ours. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 16, Jesus tells us how to live. Jesus tells us how to live, okay? In that, in that chapter, and if anybody's really familiar with the Bible, that's the Beatitudes. That is the Beatitudes. And Christ taught this for a particular reason. This is our constitution, you might say. This is what we need to see every day. You need to pick up that Bible in, in, in Matthew 5, and you need to read it all the time. The Beatitudes. But he uses two words in the Beatitudes. And I'll, I'm not going to read all the passages of Scripture, but there are two particular words. Salt and light. Christ used a lot of words in different ways. He used a lot of examples. But I like what he would do with those two particular words. What did he say to us about the light? You can't put it under a bushel and expect anybody to see it. That's what we have done as Christians today. We have conformed. We've taken that light that God has given us. We have jumped up in underneath and hide. And, and we hide in the church. We hide in our houses. But when we go out to Walmart, we're just exactly like that individual who's walking beside you shopping. There's nothing to set you apart. Jesus taught us that that light, when it's set on a candlestick, 
When you put it on the candlestick and you set it up high, everybody can see it. It's not where you can't see it. It's where it can be seen. Jesus taught us, be that light. Today we don't have, we don't have to light a light. I still do a lot of camping. I still use a lot of the older style stuff for camping. I enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. But I love these lights. I do love them. Because you can see real good. We've got to be like these lights right here. We've got to turn them up as bright as we can. Get the brightest one you've got. 100 watt if that's what you can produce. Push it out there. Let people see Jesus in you through that th light that shines from your spirit. Not from your body. Not from your mind. But the spirit. When you get the spirit working, it will follow with the body. The spirit will lead the body right on going. And salt. Now this is one my wife likes this particular little thing. Salt they used back in the day for flavoring food. And they used it to uh, uh, keep the meats from uh, spoiling. You know, salt pork and stuff like that. Any kind of meat you can, you can salt and it, it will stay for a long period of time. It will stay all right. We as Christians have got to become the salt in the world and be that disinfectant. This world is spoiled right now. And until we as Christians wake up and become a disinfectant for this world, this world is going to rot. You understand? The world is going to rot. I'm a firm believer, you know, keeping my hands clean. My wife's a nurse. <laughs> she, she, she knows all about all this stuff. And we did all the precautions. We've done all those things. But as much as we have done in this respect, it still hasn't stopped the COVID, has it? Christians can stop the nonsense in this world. All we have to do is buckle down, cinch up your bootstraps, grab up some armor. Let's go fight a battle because that's what we're after. I don't mean a battle where we're going to hurt people. I'm talking about a spiritual battle. People are going to have to understand that the minority cannot overrun the majority. And I believe in this country today, Christians are still a majority in this country. Whether, whether we're Baptist, Methodist, Pentecost, Catholic, we all have that same basic belief that Jesus is Lord and Savior, that He came and He died for my sin. We all have that. Not, not just the Baptist, not just the Pentecost, not, not just any individual group. Because I don't, I don't teach doctrine, number one. I teach Bible. I preach the Bible. And what it says in this word here is Jesus says, I am the way. The truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but through Him. Right? We have got to be that disinfectant. We have got to spread it out there and push it so hard that these sinners can't do anything but believe. It's a hard job. It's a hard chore. But we've all, we've all faced hard hardships. We've all faced... Hard things to do, and, and it's uh, we we have to be that influence for God. People, I had guys and asked me as well. You're a Christian. How, how do you know there's a God? Well, so how do you know there's not? They look at me real crazy. Well, show me. I said, Are you breathing? Yeah. Can you see the air? No. God is right here. Okay. I don't have to see him physically to know that he is in my heart. He's, got, he, he's, already, he's already set up room and board right there. He's there. He's not going anywhere. Right now, I'm not going anywhere until he decides. He is in there. In Ephesians, and I'm going to end with this. Uh, in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, I like this, having been a a soldier at one time. In the 6th chapter, the 12th and the 13th verse, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, 
against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Put on that armor. I know when they would muster us out, the first thing we had to do is grab up a rifle. That was the first thing. You slept, you ate with that thing. It was part of your body. But you took up that rifle and you grabbed your pack and you got your hard hat, all the stuff that you need, and you took off at a split second notice. You put on the armor. You gird yourself with that power and that strength. And that knowledge that you know you can defeat an enemy. We've got that knowledge today as Christians. We can defeat that enemy that's out there today. Sin is our enemy. Satan is our enemy. And we cannot turn our backs. If you turn your back on him, he will stab you just that quick. You've got to keep him in sight. You've got to keep watching for him constantly. You have got to put on that arm. You've got to fight. You've got to go out. We've got to get out in this country today and tell people, we are done. We've had enough. You get all us Christians together, and I'm telling you what, you're going to have a very mighty army on your hands. I'm serious. There's a lot of us. We don't have to fight a physical battle. We just make our presence known. That's the thing. I don't believe in fighting those physical battles. I'm too old to do it anymore anyway. But I'm a true believer that all we have to do is make our presence known as Christians. As firm believers in Jesus Christ. And I put on my armor right then. That armor's on. It's on. Right here is my sword and my shield. It's there to protect me. It's there to give me the ability to make an offensive against the enemy. And that enemy is sin. I don't have to worry about it. It's there. God has seen fit to make me that way. We got to understand today that sin is a disease. Okay? It is a disease. And as I said about the salt, we've got to be the disinfectant. We've got to be able to clean it up. We as Christians long, for a long time, have just closed our eyes to what's going on in the world and what's going on around us. We've closed our eyes. And like I said, that ostrich, when he sticks his head in the sand, which they really don't do, but it's just an old saying, they stick their head in the sand, the lion is still there. He hasn't gone anywhere. He has not gone anywhere. And if you keep your head there long enough, you might say you're going to get your tail bit off. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to happen. Christians have got to wake up today. And this is a message I'm hearing not just from myself, but from the pastor of my church and the pastors on television and other pastors are talking about the same thing. In the uh, association, we're all talking about the problems that's in this world today. How we've all had to fight COVID and how, how it's been seemingly been aimed at us. Well, you can't congregate in the church, but everybody can go to Walmart. Right? Mm, I saw it. I know everybody saw it. Don't go to church. You can go to Walmart. You go to Sears, they're gone. Go to Target. I hope they're gone eventually too. I don't need them. I don't need any of those things. God has given me the ability to be a Christian. He has given me a mind. He has given me everything I need to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. And like I said, it is a mighty, mighty army. But it's an army that is hidden under a bushel right now. Hidden. We can't hide. Goodness gracious, we can't hide. I'm not hiding. I get up here in this pulpit, I'm not hiding. I'm not hiding. 
I'm going to tell people just how it is. This is how it is. This is the perfect Word of God. It is His will, not mine, not yours. It's His will what gets done here in the near future. And if we continue the path that we're on, this country that we have enjoyed for over 200 years is just going to be another China, another Russia, or someplace like that. Whether people want to believe it or not, that's the road we're down. Because we as Christians have quit utilizing His Word, and we have quit letting ourselves be known. I know it's sometimes hard to do. It is hard to do sometimes. To go out there, especially if it's somebody you've known for a long time, a friend you worked with, and you know about every other word that comes out of their mouth is, is vulgar. It's rough. And sometimes you just think, oh, he's my friend. I just, you know, accept him the way he is. You can't accept that. You have got to let your friends, your enemies, your family know exactly where you stand on God's ground. When Moses went to talk to God at the burning bush, God told him to remove your shoes because you are on holy ground. A sinner cannot step on that ground. I can. I can remove my shoes and I can step on that ground. Because I am willing to let God into my heart and let Him work what He needs done in this world. And this world needs cleaning. We need to get a great big broom and start sweeping it out. And then we get done with that, get that disinfected. Wipe it down. Clean it up. We need to get, and I tell a lot of people, we need to get back some old Christian values. Old Christian values. And that's where I come from. I'm old Christian values. I believe in people shouting. I believe in people letting everybody know about God. I believe in gospel scenes. I'm, I remember growing up watching gospel scenes. That was the thing. We didn't go to a concert for, for the who or whoever else it is out there singing or a country artist. I went and saw the Kingsman. Mm -hmm. I saw the Masters Five. James Blackwood and the Blackwood Brothers. I could go on and on and on. That's the way it was. And we went. There would be thousands of people out there watching, listening, hoping for... And there was always people who would shout. And there was always people to witness. Great. It's great. And then over the years you saw the country music and the God, the rock and roll and stuff push its way in until the gospel music has been pushed out. Well, guess what? Rock and roll, country music all got their beginning in gospel. Every one of them. Elvis Presley even said that. You know, he had, at one time, he had the master, the uh, J.D. Sumner and the Stamps Quartet backed him up. <laughs> they all had their start in gospel music. Our Christian life begins here today. I don't care how long you've been a Christian, how, when you were saved and all that, I, it doesn't matter. Today, you can start it all over again by giving everything you've got to God. Give it all back to Him. Say, here I am. Use me. I am your servant. I am your servant. No one else. I am your servant and I will work for you. That's what God expects us to do today. If you'll all stand this morning. And I'm going to give an invitation. Uh, do you have any kind of an invitation this morning? Could you, uh, could you cue something up this morning? But while they're doing that, I want each and every one of you to bow your heads. Close your eyes right now. And I want you to be thinking. I want you to be looking for God. I want you to see God through His Son, Jesus Christ. I want you to be ready to come up to this altar today. Come to the altar. Give it all back to God because it belongs to Him to begin with. 
your very life, your very existence, all these things belong to God. And all you have to do today is come to an altar. Give God everything. We are Christians. Don't ever forget that. The power of God is within you. And I thank God every day for the life that He's given me. As the music starts this morning, if there's a heart here this morning, if you feel convicted this morning, and as I said, it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, this altar is here for prayer. I'll pray with you. I'll pray with you.